Um, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about grace a little bit. Since this thing has come up and since it's absolutely the most important reality in our life, we might as well get a little line on it and see what we're talking about. And this question of grace, you're, you're up against a real development in Christian doctrine. Because, I mean, uh, the idea of grace that we've got now it's the same, I mean, it's, there's no essential change or anything like that from the idea that the first Christians had, but nevertheless, you run into a completely different approach because it has developed all through 20 centuries of, uh, of Christian theology. And what do, you, what do you mean when you say that dogma develops and the doctrine develops? What does it, well, first of all, what does it not mean? No. Does it doesn't mean it doesn't change. It doesn't change, and that is to say, well, it does change in a way, but how doesn't it change? It does, there's no essential change. I mean, for example, see, um, the Christian Mariology, the revelation on Our Lady has never changed. From the beginning, it's always been, it's always remained the same. See? The Immaculate Conception is not, a, a doc, the, when the dogma of the Immaculate Conception was defined, nothing new was added to Mariology uh, in, in essence. But what was added? Something certainly was added, in a sense, and there was a change. Uh, what? That was... I think it was just a mere fact of the definition. Some say addition to it. Well, no, there's, well, there's more to it. Oh, there's much more, well, no, there's much more to it than that. I mean, of course, by that time, yes, there, all was needed was a definition. But see, you've had saints, for example, St. Bernard and St. Thomas Aquinas, who didn't hold the Immaculate Conception. See, so... If this had happened in their lifetime, it would have been a big change for them. They would have had to say, may I call for or something. What? Yeah, now, the, the things which were contained in Revelation were developed and brought out clearly so that people saw them and then finally defined. You see, the definition is simply saying that it was already there. See? Uh, that's one of the points that you have to, re to realize about a definition. A papal definition is simply saying that it was there before. See, it's not saying that it's there now. See, that, uh, when I, if the Pope gets up and defines that Our Lady is mediatrix of all grace, he's just saying that it was there all the time. See, and uh, now we're sure because the Church has said that it always was there anyway. See, and of course that's what gets Protestants upset because they think that when a definition comes along. The Pope is coming along and saying, now we're not going to add a new truth of faith, see? Because I say it, you've got to believe it. I've added this on, and now you've got to take it. See, which is absolutely what it isn't. It isn't that at all. Well, now with grace, uh, what they had, what you've always had since the beginning, hasn't changed. But different aspects of it have been brought out, see? And I think that in the case of grace... It's much more important to go back to the beginning and see what we've all got, because the way the aspects have been brought out, some of these aspects are so partial, and they're such little, uh, little small angles of the thing, that you, we, we, uh, since the Council of Trent, for example, we've got so concerned with certain little points about grace, little points about actual grace, and little points about justification, and little controverted points that are very technical and so forth, that we've got very far away from the original idea, that is to say we, I mean the, the average Christian, not the church, the church is still clinging to the original truth, but the average Christian tends to have, the average Catholic tends to have a rather a slanted view of grace. So what we want to do is go right back to the beginning and get the early, undifferentiated view of grace as a whole. Okay? And then probably maybe we might bring in one or two of these other things. I'm not going to go into a long course on grace, but just a few basic ideas anyway, and a few things from Scripture and from some of the fathers, and then we'll be able to, to catch it. So uh, the first thing about grace is it's the whole it's our whole Christian life. See, grace is life. That's what it amounts to. But the word grace, let's take the words. You've got to understand these words. And for perhaps today all I'll talk about will be a Greek word and a few Hebrew words. I don't know any Hebrew and I don't know too much Greek, but it's good to know these words because they're, uh, and you can get them out of books like uh, Christian, like themes of the Old Testament and things like that, which are very good. And uh, it's very important to get your original revelation, get the words in which it was revealed by God, and see what these words really contain. Because, you see, revelation is contained in words. Words are giving you some, are trying to give you some indication of a reality that God has, has revealed, 
And it's very important to get this in these words, if you can. Now, the Greek word for grace is... Charis, which is C-H-A-R-I-S. Now, have you ever seen that before? In any in any kind of a word that you can think of? From Methodius. Is it comes into charity? What's another one? Charism. All right. What's another one? <laughs> you get the, the lead medal for <laughs> originality. What about, uh, I think let's put not only add something on the end, add something on the front. Um, well, remotely maybe, but I, I think Chrisma, that's not too good. Yes? Eucharist. Eucharist, see? Uh, so, all right, the original idea of grace gets into things like charity and Eucharist. And uh, let's leave the charismatic away, uh, aside for a minute. But uh, therefore, the idea of uh, uh, our ideas of love, thanksgiving, and so forth. See. Um, so the, now take the Greek word charis, uh, just the classical Greek pagan word. The first thing that it means, which uh, I mean, it has an original meaning, which we've dropped. You see, now where uh, was uh, was any of this stuff revealed to us in Greek? See, did God speak in Greek anywhere? You get the word charis, or any of the revealed books in Greek. No. Um, well, I guess. Yeah, but it wasn't all originally written in Greek, because you got one was in Aramaic and so forth. But it's mostly in Greek. Well, so anyway, certainly St. Paul. I guess St. John, yeah, definitely is Greek. I'm not too, you know, I don't know being about this. Technical business, of it, technical side of it, but definitely the epistles of St. Paul are in Greek. See, and most of the other epistles, I guess, are in Greek. Are they all in Greek? What well, wasn't Matthew Aramaic? They're not sure. Huh? Does Greek count as the revealed uh, as a language of revelation, even for Matthew? Yeah. In other words, then, the, then the, the language of Revelation in the New Testament is Greek. Okay, well, then, then God said charis once in a while. See? <laughs> but the, the Greeks, uh, where you get it for the Old Testament is in the Septuagint, see, which is the Greek translation, which is not revealed, although St. Jerome or somebody thought that it was. See, so I'm St. Augustine, they, those people used to think that the Septuagint was so good that the Greek was practically inspired. See, it's as good as the, as the Hebrew. Well, we don't hold that anymore. Now, the Greek word charis, the, the primary meaning of it is this. Think of a little child, for example. Think of the beauty of a child. See, the beauty of a, of a say, a little eight-year-old girl or something like that. There's, you know, this sort of a charm and a radiance and the innocence and all that sort of thing. That's what charis originally means. See, now we have that word grace in that sense. See. We talk about somebody as somebody being very graceful. Of course, around, around here, we don't think in those terms. We, when we think of grace, we think only of theological grace. But, I mean, you talk about a, a, a graceful person, see? Uh, gracefulness, charm, beauty, and so forth, see? Well, now, that is the original meaning. It's this, the, the kind of a charm of a, of a beautiful, innocent person. And this charm, uh, what does it do? It radiates outward from this person, and it attracts the favor of others. So then the second meaning of grace, then, is the response that that somebody else, like the child's father, you're still thinking of this eight-year-old child, well, now the child's father, how does he respond to the grace of the child? See, Well, he's immediately attracted to it and so forth, and, and then and then he uh, welcomes and accepts and, and loves the beauty of this child. See, So there's your second meaning of grace, then, is this response on the part of the father. This favor that he shows to his child, because the child is so sweet and so charming and so forth. See? Uh, now, then when it goes a little further, I mean, he, he loves the child so much that he picks her up and embraces her and gives her a piece of candy or something like that. See, Well, now, that, that that's getting to be real grace there. See, that's, that's another the deeper meaning of charis. And this meaning of the benevolence and the gifts and so forth that uh, the, the father gives to the child because she's so charming and beautiful. And then finally, it comes around in a circle, and you've got the meaning of the gratitude and the uh, response of the child to the gift of the father. 
so that there is a, a kind of an added radiance there that comes back, the, the, the added joy of the child at, at being loved. See? So in, in this notion of charis, you've got really a kind of a circle. See? And uh, uh, in the Christian idea, of course, you don't start with the beauty of the creature, you start with the goodness of the Creator. And, and the Redeemer. But nevertheless, there is this circle. So this whole idea of grace, actually, if you look at it, if you look at the word grace, you see that it is the beauty that comes out of a relationship of love between the redeemed creature and the Creator and Redeemer. See? Now, of course, where it starts for a Christian is not in the beauty of the creature, but in the goodness of the Creator, see? who looks down upon his creature who is nothing, and who has nothing, and is simply a, even just a, simply a sinful creature, but the but God looks down upon His creature with with this favor, this grace, and as He loves His child and His redeemed sinner, and so forth, what happens is that this love makes this the, the, this creature beautiful in His eyes, see, and makes it His child, and then creates in it this this the radiance and the beauty of of the child in the sight of the father. See? But this is the basic idea of grace. It's the, but now, uh, what, after all, what is this beauty, say, going back to the beauty of the child? What is the source of the beauty of the child? Is it, it's in, uh, what is it, is it something on the skin or something like that? Or where does it come from? Where does the beauty of a child come from? It's a good question, yeah. The innocence of the soul, all right. To trace it even further back than that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not thinking of a fishing call. I mean, within the child now. See, what's the what's the source of the, of a child's beauty traced to its deepest depth yes all right life see the life of the child see so actually the beauty of a little child is actually the radiance of the child's life see the, the radiance of, of, of the uh, of the uh, the vitality both spiritual and physical and so forth in the child see but it radiates because it's alive or the child is dead. Well, you can say, what a beautiful little corpse, you know, but I mean, <laughs> as, as they always do, he looks just like he's alive, the undertaker's got her all fixed up. But, uh, but still, it's not, there isn't grace there, you see, a corpse, is, there's, you don't see this gracefulness in a corpse, it comes from life, see, the living being of the child. So that actually grace, then, is, uh, well, it's a word that emphasizes beauty, but it emphasizes the beauty of the soul that has supernatural life, see. So actually, what what we're getting down to is supernatural life, and supernatural life as a gift coming from God the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit, and so forth. So, uh, and incidentally, it's this idea of, of, of grace as uh, as gratitude that comes into Eucharistia, Eucharist. See, so that what is the Eucharist? The Eucharist is is a a, a sacrament of love. In which you've got this life, this love and life, which is given to God by his, given to the, to his children by God, which, uh, uh, appears in the mystery of the Eucharist and, so to speak, radiates outwards in the mystery of love, which unites everybody in the Eucharist. So therefore, there is a, uh, the, there is a, a beauty and a, and a, uh, a radiance in the mystery of the Eucharist, the radiance of charity. See, charity is beautiful. Charity makes the, gives the saints a spiritual beauty and, and gives the church a spiritual beauty and so forth. Now, there's a good little text here I want to start out with. Uh, in St. James here. Uh, St. James 4, he says, What causes wars? He says. We might as well read that since we're... What causes wars? And what causes fightings among you? Is it not your passions that are at war, at, your, at war in your members? You desire and do not have, so you kill. And you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Unfaithful creatures, do you not know that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? See, this is all the opposite of grace. See. Therefore, Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now here's where we come to grace. Or do you suppose it is in vain that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit which he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. So forth. See, now this, this quote, then here you've got two scripture quotations. 
Uh, God resists the, opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's from Proverbs. And that's used several times in the New Testament. Then you've got another scripture quote here, which says, He yearns jealously over the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. And this scripture quote is unidentifiable. Nobody knows where it comes from, because it, uh, they can't find it. It's got lost, see. But evidently, it is a scripture quote. And it's a very interesting quote. He yearns jealously over the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. So that gives you a very good idea of grace, yes? It has this in St. John where the Father has given me eyes. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, that's not, the, that's not that exact quote, you see. It's just, these are... It sounds something like St. Paul. Well, he's obviously referring back, he wouldn't be quoting St. Paul. See, this is St. James. And St. James wouldn't be saying... Uh, St. James would have probably th had to think twice before he called St. Paul scripture. See? Because, I mean, St. James was a was the, the, the rough and tough uh, Jewish convert, the most conservative Jewish convert. And here was Paul, a convert after our Lord was crucified. So he probably believed that St. Paul was an apostle and all that. But, I mean, they had a little trouble getting it through to some of these people, you know. So, I mean, when Paul wrote a letter, James would just sort of dash off, it says in Scripture. As Paul says in Scripture, he wouldn't be saying that. So it's obviously Old Testament. Uh, but anyway... It's a, it's a, it's this idea of the spirit in us. See, this, where does our supernatural life come from? From the Holy Spirit, and this Holy Spirit working in us and radiating in us and uh, sending forth uh, signs of charity in us and so forth is what is, is grace. See, I mean, he obviously the scholastics make a distinction between the Holy Spirit and created grace. All right, we haven't got to that yet. The Scripture doesn't make this distinction. And the fathers don't even make any distinction. For, for the fathers, there's no distinction between natural and supernatural gifts of God, and everything tends to be called grace. See? Your creation tends to be called a grace, and your nature tends to be called a grace. And when you get into St. Saint, Saint Thomas, you have, to, you have to distinguish. But they don't distinguish. And, uh, for example, when I was talking the other day about uh, how God has to help us to do everything, see? and I was talking about the natural concourse of God with our acts, and then the supernatural grace. See, well, these are two different things. I mean, if I lift my hand, see, I don't need grace, but I do need help from God. What is this help? I, mean, I can't lift my hand without the help of God. What is this help? It's called natural concourse, is what they call it, see. That is to say that, that everything, uh, nobody can do anything without God, even in the natural order. See, so, I mean, I, I need uh, the help of God for any movement. If he doesn't help me, I stop completely. See, I, uh, the reason my hands are moving around because like, God moves my hands. See, uh, that's, that's the way he wants to do it. So if he stops, then I stop. But grace is different. Grace is a supernatural motion. And, and the early fathers, and even up to St. Thomas, really, they don't make this distinction. See? And any kind of a help or any kind of a gift, they tend to regard it as a grace. See, So that, that's good in a way and it's bad in another way. Well, now, this, there is something in St. Paul, as you said, Brother Paul across over there. You, uh, you're right. See, there is something in St. Paul that's, that's parallel to this. He seems to be quoting the same thing, or he seems to be going back to the same uh, source. It's in Romans 8, which is this terrific uh, statement on grace. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. He got away from the unutterable groanings here. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See, So therefore, this is a very strong statement about grace. See, What's it say about grace? It says that grace is, this, is the Holy Spirit living in us, praying in us, working in us, without our knowing about it. See? So this is, this is what you want to get, first of all. This is where you start with your doctrine of grace. See? Grace is the, is the life of the Holy Spirit in us and the action of the Holy Spirit in us. Or you say life and action, later on they're going to distinguish those two things. See? The life they will call habitual grace, sanctifying grace, and the action they're going to call actual grace, see, which is intermittent. One is permanent and the other one uh, works from time to time. Now some of these, uh, let's look back at some of these Hebrew words. You've got several very important Hebrew words for love in the Old Testament, for different kinds of love. And they all get they, they all have come to be packed into our notion of grace and then forgotten, see. Uh, for example, the 
charis uh, usually translates the word, a uh, Hebrew word, which is hen. See, I don't know, nothing to do with what you think. Uh, that evidently is what you would say we would call favor, I guess. I suppose that's how we would translate, how usually translated by us. But I'm wrong, though. Father Romano, so correct me. But uh, it is this idea of, of, say, the father looking down upon the child with favor and pleased with the, with the way the child is acting, that sort of thing. See, that's that's charis in that sense. So now you've got all these other important words for love. Let me just, uh, well, no, I'll we'll write them on the, word, on the board first. For example, chesed. See, what's that? Who's, who's read? Uh, there's a good little book on, uh, on uh, I don't know. It's in Hesed and the Psalms. Hesed and Emmet. What is what's Hesed? Then mercy. It's mercy, and with a, with a very special slant. See? Yes? Yeah. Well, what is it? Mercy. Mercy, but I mean, uh, mercy in the sense of what? Yeah. Yeah, mercy in the sense of, of unfailing mercy. See? This, this idea of Hesed is... Uh, there is the idea that God is, is faithful to his original plan of being merciful, and he can't be turned aside from his plan of being merciful. And over against Hesed, you've got the correlative idea of the infidelity of the chosen people. See? So that God has, has this original design of mercy and salvation, and this plan of salvation is Hesed, this, which is a, a, a merciful love, which is faithful and can't be, uh, he can't be turned aside from it, even by the sins of his people. And uh, in, a, in a sense, the chesed is all the more strong when the people sin. See? And then with chesed, you always get another word, which is emet, which is truth. See? Uh, misericordia et veritas in the Latin Psalms. You see, this is very important for the Psalms. This is the vocabulary of the Psalms. See? In choir, we're always talking about misericordia et veritas and so forth. Well, misericordia is chesed and veritas is emet. And then uh, we'll see, I'll get you a text with all this stuff in it in a minute. And then there's another very important word, which is uh, this is the one I like best. It's the, sorry, it's the Muslim one too. That's it. Yeah. Now this this is this is uh, correlative to Hesed. This this uh, fulfills carries out the idea of Hesed. Hesed doesn't imply any particular feeling, but Rahamim does. See. Rahamim is the uh, tender love of the mother. So Hesed is sort of fatherly mercy, and Rahamim is motherly mercy. And so this comes into this idea of God's love too. See? And uh, this uh, the, the, the Muslims are always talking about Allah being Al Rahamim. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. It's a beautiful word. See? Uh, uh, the, the tenderly, the tender motherly mercy of God for His creature, and. Uh, so that's in there. I guess I've got all the words now. So let's take a look at Exodus here. Well, I guess I don't have to. No, I will too. Exodus 34. This is a terrific passage. This is where, again, we're getting back to the names of God. And this is where Moses uh, is up on the mountain. And uh, he says, uh, now I'm going to show you who I am. See? And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. And the Lord comes down in this cloud. See, Moses doesn't see anything at all. He's in this dark cloud with God on the top of Sinai, just after getting the law. And God is in the cloud with Moses, and Moses starts shouting out all these names of God. See, he doesn't see anything, but all this stuff is coming out from inside of him when he's in the cloud. See, so he goes like this. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Well, I guess it's really... Uh, who's proclaiming? Is it Moses or the Lord? I guess it's the Lord. I don't know. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful. See, this is the Rahamim. Is this, this is the one, that the motherly love. And gracious. This is Hen, Karis. Uh, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. See, in this Bible, steadfast love is Hesed. They always say steadfast love. They don't just say love. It's steadfast love. See? And faithfulness, that's Emet, truth. And uh, keeping steadfast love for thousands, for thousands of what? Thousands of generations and generations. He never, never failing in the, in the steadfastness of his love. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and so forth. So, uh, and then you've got this other terrific uh, 
passage of O.C., which uh, gives you again a most important idea of grace. Two twenty-one here, and in that day says the Lord. Well, before that, twenty. Uh, it's all about the Lord saying He was going to espouse His people. See, He's going to be wedded to His people. This is what grace is. Grace is a wedding with God. See, the soul that is united to God is is uh, wedded to Him, and grace is this wedding, this union. I will make for you a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the creeping things of the ground, and I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice. Now, what's righteousness? That's, uh, what was righteousness? Siddiq, that's right, Siddiq. Uh, and, uh, and in justice, what's justice? Mishpat, all right, <laughs> okay. In steadfast love, hesed, and in mercy. Rahamim. And I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. What's that? That's Hesed again, I guess. I don't know. No, Emet, Emet, sorry, pardon me. And you shall know the Lord, you shall know Yahweh. See? And and so forth. So uh, there you've got this this beautiful text with all these things in it. Now all this is packed into the idea of grace. On the Christmas midnight mass, and you've got an epistle from Titus two eleven. And it starts like this. This is midnight mass. So think back now in terms of Moses in the clouds, he in the darkness, and so forth. And in this darkness are all these names of God are being uttered, the merciful love of God. And St. Paul says, Aparuit gratia Dei Salvatoris. The grace of God our Savior has appeared. See? Now what's grace mean there? It's everything. See, it's, it's all these things. It's the emet and the hesed and the rahamin and the and the, and the sedek and the mishpat and the whole works. <laughs> see, uh, all all incarnate in the person of Christ. See, so uh, for the New Testament, the great grace of God is Christ, and the other great grace of God is the Holy Spirit. See, it's grace is the gift of God, the gift of God giving Himself to His creature. See, in Christ, in the Spirit. So, when it says that the grace of God our Savior has appeared, it means to say that all this that's written of in the Old Testament, all these things that have been said about God, and all these uh, statements that have been revealed about the love of God and the different aspects of the love of God, they're all packed into grace. So, therefore, what's the conclusion that we have to get out of this for ourselves, you see? Is we, we can't go on any longer with this with a completely abstract idea of grace. Grace is a sort of a, uh, you're in a state of grace, it means you don't have to go to confession. If you want to go to communion, you know that's 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 about as as far as it gets. Sometimes that's all we think of grace. See? What's that? What, what, what's the what's the what kind of a notion is that? It's a purely juridical notion. See, I haven't got a ticket. I don't have to appear in court. See, uh, the cop can't do anything to me because I'm innocent. See, that is to say, they haven't got anything on me. See, now this is absolutely insufficient as an idea of grace. This is, this isn't even the beginning of the idea of grace. Well, it's just barely there. I mean, I'm in God's favor in the sense that He is, uh, He's not going to punish me for anything right now. See? Uh, so this is completely insufficient. We have to bring into it all these other ideas, you see. And the, the first thing that we have to get out of grace is this idea that here I am pleasing in the sight of God because God Himself is dwelling in me. I'm pleasing in the sight of the Father because He has given me the Holy Spirit in Christ and I'm His Son. And I have in myself the life of a son. And I have the potentiality to carry out the actions of a son. And the chief action of a son is what? Is to love his father. And I have the power to love my father. See, And this is in me. And if I'm not using it, what's stopping me? Nothing. See, All I have to do, I have this, this power. I have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to me. And all I have to do is act, act in accordance with his inspiration.